for Baron and the Secret Island, I am probably going to spoil up to like Sabaody Archipelago because there is a lot of overlap that I want to talk about. Let's start by talking about the art direction because this is the first movie to heavily change its art direction from the original source. And it can be a bit divisive. Certain characters almost feel like they have a Microsoft Paint look to them. Not a lot of shadows, very thin and even line art, purposefully going out of model. But I really like it. I don't know if other movies are going to do something like that, but I really, really hope future movies have a unique art style. It creates a very specific humor when the Straw Hats are paired with this art style. Maybe they're moving a little bit more. Maybe we can exaggerate features with this art style. I can't explain it. It just has like a vibe, all right? Everything from how we mess around with the models to the less bright, less saturated color palette. And while we're talking about the art style, we're going to make it a rule here and we're just going to see if future movies live up to it, okay? If one of these movies gives the Straw Hats a different outfit, it will be a good movie. Not one different outfit, like how Chopper was the only one who got a different outfit in his movie. Not minor changes to a character's outfit, like Nami or Sanji getting a different outfit in Curse of the Sacred Sword. No, 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 no. I want everyone to have a different outfit. In this movie, the Straw Hats have multiple outfit swaps. Chopper wears this outfit that has three teardrop earrings that Zoro normally has, and then later on has a cozy blue button-up. Nami has a purple dress and a white coat, then a casual red shirt and yellow shorts, and then a fancy black dress. Sanji has this stripped yellow button-up and then this beige toned outfit. I could go on. I like that the characters are wearing different outfits, and it fits the situation that they're in. One of the reasons why the Straw Hats were even wearing these outfits was because they were originally trying to go for the so-called getaway resort island. Only to find it absolutely empty until they hear drums and then cheering and music, which leads them to find the center of the island where we get BAM. It knows what it was doing, all right? This movie has a vibe. It's a sprawling, wonderful island filled with cities reminiscent of Venice. There's large mansions and plazas. We get beautiful theme park attractions which shift around and transform. And all of this, this getaway resort could be theirs. The Straw Hats could have a holiday resort of their choosing if they beat Baron at a game. A bit Foxy-like, isn't it? Except cooler. Sorry, Foxy. You're a pretty low bar. That's right, they gotta compete in a variety of dumb games like catch the biggest goldfish or put a lifesaver on the enemy while you guys are racing. But just like Foxy's game, there's a twist. Of course there is. And like, oh, I, I love this so much. What was one of the things that I wanted from this movie? Oh yeah, spectacle. And this movie knows it's spectacle which can be a little bit hard to find in these movies. These games are also highly competitive in nature, which actually gives us the second thing that I look for, character dynamics. And this movie has by far some of the strongest character dynamics out of all of the movies so far. But we'll get to that because we actually need to talk about the twist, right? When entering this island, there is always something off-putting that we never address. At the beginning, the Straw Hats arrive in this abandoned island, empty of life, until they eventually hear music. Every single character has a leaf or a flower on its head. Even Baran has this like flower on his shoulder. But then you get distracted because they're weird goofy characters. Whenever you try to leave the island, you're caught in a forest which acts like a maze. And then that eventually brings you back into the lighthearted challenges. You see what I mean? It's, it's off-putting that way. The second I saw Flowey over here, I didn't trust that thing one bit. But it's in how we play around with these expectations. How the movie can showcase a joke and then I'd laugh and then like, wow, we're, we're really stretching this one, huh? Like we're, we're still going. Oh, oh. One of the things that this movie excels at is its ability to multitask in a scene. We can have a character interaction showcasing the love between the straw hats and then we equally showcase the tension that's always under the surface. We can showcase a lighthearted scene that's meant to be played off as a joke and how it's very much walking a line between something serious and something light. And that is something that this movie tries to do as much as possible because this movie is at heart a character study on the relationships between the entire cast. So for reference, this movie was made before Water 7, but very similarly to Water 7, it touches on a lot of similar points but to an even higher degree. In the second game, for example, we see Sanji and Zoro first beginning to argue. It is a small back and forth, but one that Usopp steps in and interrupts. This is played off like in the normal story, something that is meant to be lighthearted and meant as a joke. 
But underneath that joke, there's tension in this interaction. It's always diffused, or the characters always manage to put it aside to get the job done. But this movie says, what if we let that tension build? What if these character interactions went sour? What if it goes from, hey, watch it, to, hey, watch it? Because in every single one of these jokes that the story plays, there is an insecurity that we explore. There has always been tension in the crew, but we have never solved it. And this movie uses those points of irritation to explore the worst sides of the Straw Hats. Usopp's cowardice and lies. Nami's initial betrayal at the start of the series. Zoro and Sanji's rivalry with one another. Luffy's childish and distracted actions with the villains all playing a role in crafting games that target those weak foundational beams that make up the crew. And it hurts. <laughs> when you begin to understand what's happening, everything that used to be a goof is now a potential bomb waiting to go off. Any slight argument isn't funny anymore. Even when it's presented as a joke, it's worrisome. You're waiting for the tension to dispel like it would in the normal series, but it doesn't. Now this isn't purely psychology though through the villain sections. There are glimpses of some kind of magic system at hand. It's not purely a devil fruit that's controlling everyone with the flower on their heads. This flower isn't itself a devil fruit nor does it appear to be part of any existing fruit ability. It is just a creature that exists and has abilities that aren't really elaborated on in this story. That can be a huge divisive topic for some. We're in uncharted waters here. We've seen the Cursed Holy Sword, we know things can get out of hand. But look, it's all non-canon stuff, alright? My rule with non-canon stuff is that if we're gonna change something from the original source, at least make it interesting. And I think Baron and the Secret Island does keep it interesting. There's a beautiful section where Baron's crew is talking about Roger, how Baron is cool and strong and he might be able to beat Roger. You know, that Roger? The young upstart they just met a couple of days ago. What? What do you mean he's dead? We just, we, we just saw him a few days ago. And then the dots all start connecting. All of Baron's crewmates are dead and they get reborn every day by the flower. Like they are stuck in a repetitive dreamlike loop. They also don't remember everything after they've died and it's beautiful and haunting. It uses Flowey over here to explore the relationship between a captain and his crew. It uses Flowey to manipulate the Straw Hat's emotions into an extreme. It uses Flowey to explore Baron's relationship to his own crew. How after the death of his crew, he was a broken version of himself. How instead of picking himself up and trying again, he instead chooses to inflict that same pain onto others. How instead of finding a new crew and hopefully doing better, he instead relies on dead versions of his past in order to manipulate and kill other pirates. Firstly, that's very interesting from a character perspective. Secondly, it tackles the concept of that captain and crew dynamic when all of the crew dies. Which, thirdly, is something that is actually represented in the actual story through Moria. Like, hear me out, if the secret island is representing the collapse in the crew like in Water 7, then Baron is practically Moria in Thriller Bark. He is the depiction of what a captain who has lost his entire crew and does not have a crew to rely on becomes. Baron's entire strategy is to isolate and take out the Straw Hats one by one. This is in part the result of the crew falling apart. The crew has been wanting to leave the island for a little bit now, but reluctantly has followed Luffy's commands. But after a few of the Straw Hats are gone and the tension starts to build up, the possibility that Luffy might just be a kid who doesn't really understand how to handle the responsibility of being a captain starts to become worrying. This was before Water 7, when everyone was still goody-two-shoes with each other, when they didn't really think captain's orders were anything other than a suggestion by Luffy. And when push comes to shove, this is another weak foundational beam that begins to collapse. So they leave. They're waiting for Luffy to give a command, and he's just standing there. And they know Luffy can take on Baron, but they're like, hurry up, man, we're not in the mood right now. We need a search for the rest of our crew, and so they just leave without him. Sure, Luffy has been the I'll fight the bad guy alone, but in this instance, that is exactly what Baron wants. And that is exactly what Luffy gives him. After everyone splits to find the other Straw Hats, Luffy goes on a 1v1 with Baron, and it is this very brief fight where Luffy loses, it's pretty one-sided, 
and Baron lies to him, telling Luffy that his whole crew is dead. And Luffy regresses. Just like Moria, you can see the path that would lead up to that. Throughout this story, we have seen glimpses of other pirates who have landed and died on this island. There are pirate graveyards full of sunk, crashed ships. One of the crews who is stranded here is from this family who wanted to become pirates and don't really seem to want anything other than to go on an adventure and have fun. And they're stuck in this twisted island. We also have this guy whose entire crew was wiped out by Baron, and now he's alone. I really like these characters, not because they're anything spectacular. Sure, they're goofy, and I like that they're goofy, but they do feel like innocent side characters. And I really like these side characters, because they're really just side characters. There were people who wanted to have fun adventures with their crew, heard about this island, and now are people who are either struggling to maintain their relationships, or have entirely lost their crew. It's only fitting for this movie to use these characters to create a strong bond between them and the Straw Hats. They are the characters who cheer the Straw Hats on and hope they thrive. They're the characters who pick up Luffy after he thought he lost it all. And I think it's fitting that these are the characters that are responsible for taking down Baron. Luffy and all these side characters join together to take on Baron, and it is not a clean 1v1. It wasn't designed to be. The story explicitly argues against it. And only when reconciling with that fact can they actually take Baron down. So after they defeat Baron, the whole crew comes back and meets Luffy. And if I had one complaint about this movie, it's that we never really wrap up this tension. Like sure, we defeated Baron and the flower, but all of that drama that happened, it never went away. It's still in the background. And I think while Water 7 tackles the resolution to that problem, this movie doesn't really do that. If we had maybe one scene where they say sorry or something, I'd feel so much better. But still, I'm going to be thinking about this one for a while. It is like an alternate version where you see like the real darker side of the story where the Straw Hats fall apart and, uh, whew, I don't know. I'm going to go read some lighthearted One Piece to feel better. All right, uh, bye-bye.